Oldsmobile history contains many different models that were highly successful over the years. Everything from the Delta 88 to the 98 to earlier or prior to the Delta 88, there was the Del Monte 88, the Super 88. Even the F-85, the Cutlass especially, were highly successful nameplates for Oldsmobile. So much so that, in fact, in the 1977 model year, Oldsmobile sold about 630,000 Cutlasses, just Cutlasses, 630,000 of them in the 1977 model year. And that included about 243,000 Cutlass Supreme Coupes and 125,000 Cutlass Supreme Brome Coupes. So just on the Cutlass Supreme alone, Oldsmobile sold about 375,000 of those in 1977. So the Cutlass franchise was hugely profitable in the mid and late 1970s, especially as fuel economy became increasingly important. Buyers were starting to really downsize from full-size vehicles to the intermediate vehicles, and the Cutlass just fit the bill for many people. It was a little bit trimmer overall, But especially if you got the four-door, there was plenty of room inside. In fact, just about the same amount of room as the full-size car. And the car was a bit shorter and lighter and got better fuel economy. And they rode and drove extremely well. You, of course, in that 1977 model year, often would find a 350 cubic inch V8 under hood in the Cutlass. Although you could even get a small 260 cubic inch Oldsmobile sourced V8 or Buick's 231 cubic inch V6 under hood in those years. However, in 1978, Oldsmobile introduced a new body style, and it would prove to be an absolute flop in the marketplace. That is the Cutlass Salon, as you can see here. The Cutlass Salon, as I said, was introduced in 1978. You could get it in a number of different forms, the base four-door and the coupe. There was also a brome four-door as well as a coupe. And while Oldsmobile tried to portray this Cutlass Salon as something more European, if you will, and in vogue for the times, especially given its more compact dimensions and relatively good packaging, it kind of was a preview of what was to come with the X-Cars, in particular the Citation hatchback, the Phoenix hatchback. But it just never looked quite right. Apparently, GM designers had fallen in love with sketches that had been done by an artist that I will not name, but who was able to create very dramatic sketches of a body style that looked like this with a hatchback, kind of fastback rear profile. And of course, designers became enamored with that particular piece of artwork, including GM's design chief at the time this car was being developed, Bill Mitchell. The problem, however, was that the overall packaging of the vehicle just couldn't accommodate what the designers wanted to do. And this is one of those cases where perhaps the designers cheating from a sketching perspective. In other words, trying to give the car an endowment with different dimensions than what it really was about to have in production, including the wheelbase or the overhangs or things like that. It just really hurt it because they thought that they could make this an attractive car, especially in four-door form. This 1978-79 to Cutlass Salon was absolutely hideous. And that's just not my opinion, but the sales figures really bear that out. In 1978, in its inaugural year, the Cutlass Salon was, well, let's just say it wasn't a big success. It sold, eh, you know, somewhere around 80-ish thousand units in that year. But by 1979, one year later, it had really just fallen on its face. It was an absolute flop. The Cutlass Salad in total in 1979 was selling about 50,000 units. And bear in mind that the whole Cutlass franchise, as I said, in 1977 was selling 630,000 units. For 1978, the overall sales of Cutlasses got cut by about 100,000 units because the salon was not nearly as successful as General Motors had hoped. It was such a flop, in fact, that for the 1980 model year, Oldsmobile designers would effectively copy the body style of the 1976 to 79 Seville and reintroduce the four-door Cutlass in, well, let's say, a more regular form, something that resembled the up-level Seville and was quite handsome in general. But the damage had been done, and the Cutlass sales never really recovered to the point that they were at in the 1977 model year, although they did remain strong for a number of years.
However, if you notice, the topic of this particular video was the worst flop, and that was the 1979 model year for the Cutlass Salon. And that's for a few reasons. One is the sales figures that I mentioned. But there were some elements of content as well that made the 1979 model year the nadir for these particular Cutlass Salons. And I'll describe that in a minute. But first of all, an important point when these vehicles were introduced. This was, as I said, an all-new platform and design that came out in the 1978 model year. And it replaced a tried-and-true Cutlass design that was riding atop 116-inch wheelbase for the sedans and 112-inch wheelbase for the coupes in the 1977 model year. For 1978, both the four doors and the coupes went atop 108.1 inch wheelbase and got all new styling. Now recall, this was a time period when General Motors was very focused on fuel economy and consequently weight, as well as content in vehicles. And one of the results of this is that these A-body vehicles, not just the Cutlass Salon, but all of the General Motors A-bodies that were introduced for the 1978 model year, lacked rear windows that went up or down. And I said that right. Yes, the rear windows on these vehicles were immovable. They were fixed in place on the four doors. For anyone that thinks I'm joking, take a look at this door panel here, and you can see there's no window crank, there's no window switch, there's no nothing. Now, why was this done? It was done in part because of weight. Obviously, if you don't have to move the window up and down, you can save on the regulator. If it's a power window, you can save on the power window motor. And it also, well, helped out with cost. Apparently, GM had performed some studies that investigated how often drivers actually lowered the rear windows in their vehicles and found that really they almost didn't touch them most of the time unless there was a rear passenger back there. And so they thought, well, Nobody uses them. Let's just take them out. So they saved weight. Obviously, another benefit of this from a General Motors standpoint was that they saved cost as well because obviously there's a lot less componentry in there. And it did allegedly give GM a bit more rear hip room because the door panel could be made thinner since it didn't have to accommodate all that hardware in the door. Now, what's interesting is that while you couldn't lower that big pane of glass, you can see here in this particular vehicle, you could actually extend the rear windows in some models so that you could get a little bit of ventilation back there. And when the body style went to the 76 to 79 style for the 1980 model year, that rear pane of glass could actually be rotated so that you got a little bit of ventilation if you sat in the back seat. In fact, that's what the power window switch is on this rear door for this particular Cutlass Salon. That is to operate the optional power motor that would push out that rear pane of glass to get you some extra ventilation. But in no cases was that rear door glass made movable. It was just fixed. And I think that was really something that though customers didn't necessarily use it, it's one of those features you talk to your friends about or your friends talk about say, how in the world could you have a car with a window that doesn't move up or down in the rear? And frankly, it was true. The other downside of these vehicles is they weren't as well built as their predecessors. The Cutlass that ended production in the 1977 model year clearly was a great looker with, in particular, its waterfall grill and body side sculpture, and that's what propelled it to be a sales success. But this new Cutlass that came out in 1978, including the Salon, just wasn't as good of a looker, and the vehicle wasn't as well built. And everything from serviceability on these vehicles to the durability was just more challenged, I would say, than the predecessor model. Take, for example, if you ever have to replace a heater core on one of these, it is a total bear of a job. Whereas on the previous model, it wasn't necessarily easy, but it was considerably easier than on these cars. You also had some anemic powertrains under hood. As I mentioned, you could get the Buick V6 in the 1978 Olds Cutlass Salon. You could get the Oldsmobile 260 cubic inch V8. You could get the Chevrolet 305 V8, which, by the way, Oldsmobile had learned from its debacle in the 1977 model year, where it had been caught putting Chevrolet V8 engines in Oldsmobiles. And notice this page in the 1978 Oldsmobile brochure that very prominently declares what engine comes from which GM division and even where it's produced. So GM was trying to 
be as transparent as it could with its buyers, really in light of that 1977 series of scandals and lawsuits that it had faced. In any case, the powertrain choices were unquestionably anemic, and the 231 cubic inch V6 for the Cutlass Salon made 105 horsepower. The 260 cubic inch V8 made 110 horsepower. And the 305 in top form made 165 horsepower. Really just not great. But in particular, I highlighted the 1979 model year as the Cutlass Salad that was the super flop because there was a one-year-only engine that was available in that vehicle, and that is the Oldsmobile 260 cubic inch V8 diesel. So most of you are probably familiar with the Olds diesel that displaced 350 cubic inches that came out in 1978. And some of you may be familiar with the Oldsmobile 4.3 liter V6 diesel that could be found under hood in the A cars like the Cutlass Sierra, as well as the C cars for one year, 1985. Well, this is different. This is a 4.3 liter V8 diesel that was offered for one year only, and it made all of 90 horsepower. And no, the torque rating wasn't that great either. It was just absolutely anemic, and the road tests of that time suggest the same. I think the Consumer Guide tested an Oldsmobile Cutlass Salad with this 260 cubic inch V8 diesel, and it took 19, 20 seconds, something like that, to go from zero to 60. You know, 90 horsepower when you're trying to push around a car that is admittedly relatively light, you know, 3,200 pounds, uh, is still pretty challenging. You just don't have a great horsepower to weight ratio. And as a result, those 20 second zero to 60 times are what the consequence is. So I suppose that this 260 cubic inch V8 diesel was such a flop because nobody ordered it and it was just so anemic that Oldsmobile dropped it after one year. And they did keep their 350 cubic inch diesel, which by the way, depending on the year, made generally between 105 and 120 horsepower. So it wasn't all that much more powerful, but it did have more torque and it certainly was better than that 250 cubic inch 4.3 4.3 liter V8 diesel that was offered only for that year. Stay tuned for a video. We'll talk more about that engine in an upcoming video. But aside from that, let's take a look at the photos here of this particular 1979 Cutlass Salon Brome. And first of all, you just notice from the side profile that the car looks awkward. The overhangs front and rear just are not helping. And the overall style, I'm sure that this is not what the designers want, but In the end, that's what they got. It's really an unflattering profile. From the back here, you notice that the car has a what looks like a hatchback, but it's not. The trunk is only the portion that opens there with the cut that you can see visibly. And the trunk opening is really small. The trunk itself isn't that large. I think they're about 14 cubic feet. You can see it here. They did have a compact space saver spare that you see there that's standing upright that helped with space. There really wasn't much space in this trunk, particularly in the vertical dimension. I do love also this little piece of trim that appears to be a vent, but it's fake. Kind of in the trend of the 19, excuse me, 63 Corvette Stingray with its visual sculpture that wasn't functional. As we look at the inside of this particular Cutlass Salon Brome, Eh, you know, a number of things stand out. Take a look at the instrument panel, which I think is actually kind of a handsome design. It looks rather good. I like that pod that comes out to meet the driver. The steering wheel is rather plain and looks pedestrian, particularly for an up-level Oldsmobile. And this was an unfortunate steering wheel that Oldsmobile had in between some really good steering wheels, but doesn't look great in that car. And if we look at the seats, they also don't have that same level of comfort, perhaps, that prior Oldsmobiles had. They're relatively thin. Oldsmobile was trying to get more rear seat room. So the seat backs themselves are not that thick. And, well, they're just not that attractive or interesting, perhaps because in this particular photo, they're white. But in other forms, there were bucket seats that you could get that looked somewhat attractive. But, you know, I think that overall the seating wasn't that great. The door panels are interesting. They do look a little bit rich. And if you look at this driver's door panel here, you can see there's power window switches for the front, power lock switches, the mirror control, 
And then you also have a set of power window switches that are to operate, as I mentioned, those rear glass panes and to get some extra ventilation. Now, under hood in this particular Cutlass Salon Brougham, you have the Chevrolet 305 cubic inch V8. You can tell that because it doesn't have the oil fill tube right in the front like the Oldsmobile V8s of this era did. And I guess this particular buyer wanted the top engine option, although, as I mentioned, it didn't endow this vehicle with all that much scoot. And you can see here on the rear door panel that there is that power window switch for this Cutlass Salon, but again, it's not for the main pane of glass. It's for that rear pane of glass to operate it. So overall, this Cutlass Salon was really just an unfortunate vehicle from a design standpoint, even from an assembly standpoint. These cars weren't assembled well. They didn't have all that great reliability. Uh, if you got that Oldsmobile 260 cubic inch diesel, it really was not that reliable. The Buick 231 cubic inch V6 during this era was also not that great. Even though it had some of its shakes smoothed out by this point, the lower end on these really wasn't that strong. So they lasted maybe 110,000, 120,000 miles. And after that, that was about it. This wasn't the Buick 3800 engine that would last forever. And the Chevrolet 305 was actually a pretty decent V8, although they did have soft camshafts during this time period. So that could be an issue if you had one of those under hood. Your best bet was probably, honestly, to get the Olds 260, which was anemic, but pretty robust and reliable, at least relatively speaking. Unfortunately, many of those engines were also backed by GM's Turbo Hydromatic 200 transmission, which, again, was just an awful transmission. It was basically a grenade behind any of those engines and it was effectively a redesigned Chevette transmission that GM put in these vehicles primarily for weight savings as well as cost. And it just didn't last. It was not a Turbo Hydromatic 350 or 400, which were virtually indestructible. And often buyers had problems with them. I would say by the 40, 50,000 mile mark, if you were trying to tow a trailer with one of those Turbo Hydromatic 200 transmissions under hood, uh, it was just not going to last very long at all. And so the consequence of all this was that GM's reputation really started to decline. And it's unfortunate because, as I mentioned, the predecessor Cutlass from 1977 really was a great vehicle with great engines, great transmissions, rear ends. Uh, interiors were okay. Uh, if you got the Brome, you got some funky interior patterns. But that was generally a great vehicle. And this 1978, between the issues I mentioned, not having the operable rear window glass, having that terrible transmission under hood, relatively poor and anemic powertrains under hood, poor assembly quality, you know, ugly looks. It just was a terrible combination and set Oldsmobile back a number of years. But that was the decision. And then in 1980, sales ended up picking up again because the four-door was redesigned and was more conventional. And that vehicle stuck around for many years and in coupe form, it stuck around until the late 1980s and was very successful. So I hope you enjoyed this spotlight on the 1979, well, and also 1978 Cutlass Salon. If you did, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe and check out the video thumbnails at bottom left and right for some suggestions for you. Thanks again for watching.